Well, this is definitely the sparkliest river I've ever made, and the bluest, and also probably the most problematic. There'll be times during this video that I don't talk very much, and that's because it's largely self-explanatory. But I did make one cock up in particular that I'd like to discuss, so stick around for that. However, that doesn't happen for a while yet, so let's crack on in the meantime. The main body of this piece was made using a product called Sculpture Block, and therein lay most of the problems experienced later on with the resin pouring. It's not a problem with the product as such, more a problem with me not coating the product adequately before pouring the resin. But as I said, we'll come to that later. Now I don't really know what Sculpture Block is. It's not extruded polystyrene, it's more like a very dense florist's foam. It doesn't cut with a hot knife, but it carves very easily with a sharp blade. Here I'm using a cheap florist's knife. And I can tell you that carving a river channel like this creates a lot of mess, so you'll want your vacuum cleaner handy. And it does get very dusty, so you might want to wear a mask. There are a lot of fine particles in this foam. And now I'm going to stop talking for a bit because there's a lot of carving going on. All I'll say is be very careful when using a sharp knife. Don't try and pick out bits of foam that are too big for the knife to cope with easily. Blades like this can snap and they obviously can cause injury. And that's why later on you'll see me using a table knife to cut out tougher bits of foam. But anyway, enjoy watching this next section of video and I'll be back in a bit. Okay, so with the main channel complete, it was now time to start carving out the rock shapes. To achieve this, I looked at some photos on Google and then just, you know, copied them. I mainly used the florist knife. Again, please be careful. But as you'll see in a bit, I also used a pointy skewer, although a cocktail stick would do just as well, being pointy and everything. You can't really go too wrong here, just keep looking at your photos and take it slowly. Thank you. 
Don't hold the knife like I'm holding it here. Don't know why I did, not very sensible. Here I'm using the blunt end of the skewer to make impressions in the rock. This foam yields rather nicely to this kind of work. And remember at this stage it is all about the details, but you can add too many details so they all become indistinct from each other. Leave some nice panels of rock visible. The foam itself has a nice texture to it, not dissimilar from uh, rock. One detail that really does bring the realistic appearance of the rock up another level is stratus lines. These are made first with the blunt bit and then later on with the pointy bit. So when earlier on I said a cocktail stick would be as good as a skewer, I was... Well, it depends whether your skewer has a blunt end or not really. Easy enough to blunt the end I suppose, and on a cocktail stick. Here's the scratchy pointy end bit. This really is just a case of scratching over the surface in one direction using the pointy end of your cocktail stick or skewer as we've discussed. I'm not sure this is a team skewer versus team cocktail stick kind of situation really. But if it was, I, you know, I'd be on team skewer for sure. Right, so when all the carving on the rocks is done you'll want to tidy up your riverbed and I'm using my trusty table knife for this. Just kind of scraping it along, smoothing everything out. This will all be covered in texture anyway. And it does get very dusty as I said, so you'll want to brush off any excess. Just look at all that mess. If the room isn't messy, it doesn't feel like you've really been working. But anyway, look at that. Lovely hand-carved rocks. And the next stage was to apply textures to the piece. I wasn't worried about colours at this stage because all of this would be primed anyway, I'm just after the textures. And these get applied very roughly to make sure there are plenty of textures going on on the surface. I certainly didn't want any of this to be uniform in texture. This thick mud by Vallejo is one of my favourite texture pastes. It's got little bits of twig and leaf and everything in it. However, this certainly isn't a muddy scene, so I used it instead as a kind of rough ground texture. And here I am applying it along the riverbank, blissfully unaware that later on none of this would be visible at all, and in fact I needed to coat the riverbed in a layer about four times thicker than that, or using Sculptor Mold or something, 
in order to prevent the foam reacting with the resin. I really should have thought about that in advance, but I didn't. So, what are you going to do? Fix things afterwards, that's what you're going to do. After having a bit of a tantrum and sitting with your head in your hands and that kind of thing. Anyway, before all that comes the rest of the texturing and here's what I used. With the paste not quite dry, it was easy to press some of this into place, but you're going to have to use some scenic glue as well, which, as we all know, is one part matte medium and three parts water. And for these bigger stones, you'll also need a blob of white glue underneath or matte mod podge. And you can also use the matte mod podge in place of the matte medium in your scenic glue. For these stones I picked out of my garden path, however, I forgot to show the gluing on process. Here I was just test fitting them. And here's the scenic glue I mentioned earlier. There's no harm in going a little bit overboard with this, just to make sure that everything is fixed down securely. You can soak up any excess using a paper towel, but then just make sure you let everything dry. This should only take one or two hours. And when it comes to priming, I use this Hydro Primer from Plasticoat because it's meant to be foam safe. But still, I would avoid spraying too closely so that the propellant doesn't have a chance to eat into the foam. And for the rock undercoat, I use two shades of brown, a yellow and a kind of stone colour. And then I just kind of mixed them all up. There was no great technique to this as you can see. On the rock faces, however, I went with just the stone colour as an undercoat. To highlight the rocks, I used Verdigris Game Colour from Vallejo. I tend to apply highlights before washes, as this lends the colours more nuance. I'm not really into dry brushing as a final step. It doesn't create a very naturalistic look. And speaking of washes, this is where I went over the entire rock surface with black wash, paying particular attention to any crevices like this and like that. Painting the wash over the surface also makes sure that it creeps into all the little pores in the rock face. Where I wanted a subtler shade over the rocks, I diluted the wash with a bit of water and as you can see by the river of wash running down my riverbed, I used a lot of wash on this piece. Trusty paper towel to the rescue again. After a couple of hours drying time, the model looked like this. The black wash really accentuated all the beautiful details in the rock surface. 
I only used these contrast paints on a couple of stones on the bottom of the riverbed and this subtlety didn't show at all once I'd applied the water, so I may as well have painted them a dark grey or something. But perhaps what did make a difference was painting the riverbed blue. I knew I was going to tint the resin as well, but I didn't want to leave anything to chance really. And I felt that painting the riverbed blue would add more depth to the river as well. Again, I was going for subtlety and I needn't have. To my eyes, all of this highlighting was obscured by the resin and later on by the water products I used over the top of the resin. Anyway, I blended the blue into the stony banks using some more of the stone acrylic colour. To simulate moss growing along the banks of the river, I used two colours of Woodland Scenic's Fine Turf. This was burnt grass and green blend mixed together. And then I painted on some scenic glue over the rocks where I wanted the moss to go. Sprinkled over the fine turf. and then gave all the moss a good spray with isopropyl alcohol to break the surface tension before dripping over more scenic glue to lock it all in place. For the resin dam I used a piece of sheet plastic which I cut from an old packet and to fix this to the edges of the piece I used some white glue and then carefully pressed the plastic into place. Later on you'll see that I actually used some masking tape to secure this. The resin I tend to use is Water Clear Epoxy from CFS. They're based in Cornwall here in the UK. You just mix it in two equal parts by volume and we're going to be adding tint to part A which is the resin part and you can see here that I've measured out the volume of each part on a mixing cup. And the tint is glass paint. Now this is a transparent glossy paint, ideal for tinting epoxy resin it seems. And I used a lot of turquoise, a bit of green and a bit of yellow mixed them all together until I had the kind of bluey, greeny, turquoisey colour I was after. And I started off by just putting a little bit on the end of my mixing stick and mixing this into the resin. And then basically mixing in little bits more at a time until I was happy with the tint. And as you can see here, I've already introduced a load of bubbles into this resin. That's from mixing it too fast. I wasn't too worried at this point because I thought I could just use my blowtorch when the resin was poured and get rid of all the bubbles, but it turns out that these bubbles were the least of my worries. I made the tint slightly darker than I intended the river to be, and that's because when you add part B it dilutes the colour a little bit. Keep mixing the resin until all the colour is thoroughly mixed in and there are no streaks. And when there are no streaks, that's when you know that the two parts of the resin are thoroughly mixed. Always a nervous moment pouring your resin. Will the dam hold? Will the resin react with the foam? Yes, the dam held. Yes. Oh, there's some bubbles there. 
Hmm, that's a bit of a concern. Oh, I mean... Oh, look at my lovely water all ruined and everything. You can even see the marks there where I've tried to fix things and ended up dragging streaks of resin across the surface. Oh well, I wasn't going to abandon the piece. I hate waste. Wasted time and wasted materials. No, I was going to fix this and that little resin lip there, which occurs when the resin dries and creeps up the dam, that was going to come in handy. After a little tidy up. Gentle reminder to use your knife more carefully than it appears I'm doing here. And here's my solution. Water Ripples by Woodland Scenics. It's a very thick gel. I just poured a layer over the surface and this hid the bubbles rather nicely and those it didn't hide. Well, flowing water has bubbles in it, doesn't it? This stuff takes ages to dry, so you can push it around with your brush and it will find its level again. And look, that lip I mentioned has acted as a dam, how convenient. But of course this product isn't called Water Ripples for nothing. As it dries, you can dab it with your brush to create the most beautiful undulations in the surface of your water. You might need to repeat this over and over again though, as I said, ages to dry. But actually it turned out a little bit too glossy for my tastes, and I wanted more subtle ripples in there, so I went back to my tried and trusted Mod Podge gloss. Applied a thin layer over the water ripples, once they had dried of course. And used a straw to blow it into lovely delicate ripples. I also added some more surface detail into the water where the current would be flowing off the edges of the rocks, etc. And this is what it looked like after I'd finished applying the Mod Podge. And this is what it looked like after about an hour. Vallejo foam and snow texture is basically a very thick acrylic as much as I can tell, but I use it for white water anyway. It's easy to overdo the white water, so go easy. Whatever you do, don't use alcohol to wipe off any excess paint, because it will just eat through the Mod Podge and possibly through the water ripples as well, though I don't know for sure about the ripples. As with most of my dioramas, the vegetation comes from dioramapresape.com. They're based in Italy, and I'm often told that I pronounce their name incorrectly, but in any case, they're the best scenics I've ever used. And for sticking them down, I use World War Scenic's Basing Glue. Presepe? Presepe? I don't know. Amazing stuff, though. A lot of their products are stabilised natural material, which makes for incredibly realistic scenics, as you can imagine. I'm not really sure why I painted the basing glue onto the rock surface before applying these small static grass pieces. I should have painted the glue onto the bottom of the grass. 
Even Mod Podge matte dries with a bit of a satin finish, so save yourself some touch up time by applying the glue to the bottom of the tuft. Ah look, it seems I've learnt my lesson, although they do tend to get stuck to your fingers when you do this. For rocky terrain like this it was important to go sparingly with the greenery, but also to avoid that kind of unnatural patchy look. Adding height helps with this, and since I didn't want to put any trees on this model, these bushes served that purpose very well. Many of these little strands can be planted among the strands of the static grass and other vegetation, and all they need is a little bit of glue on the bottom of each, and they stand up very nicely, except for that one. And that's it! Nothing to it, eh? I definitely won't make the same mistake with the resin and the foam again, but after all that I'm still really happy with how this turned out. I hope you enjoyed watching. Thanks for joining me. You might like to know that I've started writing an ebook, and I'm releasing each new chapter as I write it on my Patreon page. Each chapter will be a very detailed tutorial on a diorama project not seen on my YouTube channel, and considerably more in depth too. I've just released the first tutorial and it's over 50 pages long with more than 170 photos. You can also download the tutorials from my website highiworkshop.co.uk, but the best deal is definitely over on my Patreon page. And honestly, I couldn't do this without my Patreon supporters, so a huge thank you to all of them. And thank you to you for joining me. I'll see you next time. Bye.